this meeting is being recorded. Thank you and welcome to our pro social seminar. Um, it's a uh, it's really a privilege to welcome Heidi to our seminar. Usually, David Sloan Wilson hosts these uh, seminars, and I am very lucky that I get to do it today. Um, and I relish this opportunity to reinvent and reinvest in field science, and especially in the context of creating spaces where science uh, meets spirit and spirit meets science, and to um, honor the moment we find ourselves in. I would like to take a moment to um, honor, to light a candle. And um, and I, I pray, I, I invite kind of, this is my invitation to all of our ancestors to be with us. I find that this week I found out that two uh, people in my network committed suicide and I cannot, you know, help but recognize that um, we are, are in a very difficult moment. We, we are witnessing war all around us and a lot of pain and terror. And I don't want any life to go in vain. And so to honor Remembrance Day, uh, I would like to invite all of our ancestors to be in this moment where science meets spirit. And I can't imagine a better person to 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 uh, be in that space with than than Heidi Stelzer, uh, who's a German-born American scientist of Arctic and Alpine ecology, speaker, writer, and professor at Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado, teaching biology and environmental uh, and biology and environment and sustainability. She's known for her work on snowmelt and how it affects ecosystems in the surrounding areas. She's a lead author on high mountains for an intergovernmental panel on climate change special report in 2019 and is working on her first book, Stories of Mountain Science and Discovery about how the earth changes us. She is the founder of the Heidi Mountains Cooperative and proprietor of the Haven, a new field station and relational leadership center in Cortez, Colorado. So help me welcome Heidi to a pro-social world. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Do I sound okay? Yep, sounds all good. I'm excited to be here with you all. Um, I debated whether to prepare slides or not, and then I did, um, because I think the stories um, will work better um, with visuals to be able to tell um, the stories. So um, the slides are up now and I'll begin. Um, let's see where to begin. I, we all are on a journey and the journey takes us places we never imagined. And when we think we want to step into the world to serve and serve in a role of um, leading, we may find that the person we um, we are leading most is ourselves. So that's where this title comes from, leading change in ourselves for our world. And a couple ways to connect with me on social and via email. My expertise is in the science of mountains, high places. Um, I've also worked in high latitudes, uh, tundra areas, and recently knew I began theology school uh, with the goal of becoming a public theologian as a complement to what I already do, not to replace um, being involved in the science, but to have um, more knowledge and understanding um, where and how we connect to the divine from some of the traditions that have been long established in our world. Next slide. What I've been learning is that the ideas that arise in us are not often new. They've been arising in one of us, in many of us, for centuries. And it's beautiful to acknowledge um, that the past returns to us in new ways. 
and that the ideas that we may have um, are known by others and where and how we connect to one another becomes ever more important as we recognize at, at a critical moment for humanity and for the planet, like where we're at right now, um, that these ideas are emerging in many. For me, I've learned to take, um, to be excited when the same idea that's going on in me is going on in someone else, um, rather than to feel competitive or to feel like I have to claim it for myself. Um, but that's that's a learned space um, to balance the space of Western science that I've long been in, where there's a lot of claiming um, of ideas and that that's how, where and how, um, how careers um, develop and get advanced. I'm a storyteller, uh, and this is the first telling of many of these stories in this way. Uh, so forgive me if um, uh, some things come out um, slower, faster, um, and with some variety. Like I, this is the space that I want to gravitate into, um, but some of this is new for me. So next slide. The stories that I promised to tell are about transformation. This is a very fitting space, uh, pro-social world, to be talking about transformation. The stories that I'll tell are um, from my own personal experience about how the earth takes part. We are part because what of a, emerges in the collective that can't emerge when it's just um, us on our own and where and how the divine or the creator takes part too. Next slide. This is exciting to share. Climate change science is out there. It's out there in the world. Things that I've been studying for 30 years, I decided to um, step into this space of planetary science, um, earth system science as a sophomore in college in 1992. So over 30 years now. And some of what used to be what climate scientists would would offer in seminars we don't need to offer anymore um if, if for my students at, co at the college who are in their 20s um this has been their whole life um has been an understanding of planetary change um, um by what they experience and by what is in the media um and then for other others of us more and more of us keep seeing and receiving these insights um, in more ways. Some of it is by the people who speak into these spaces. Some of it increasingly is um, direct experience that many of us may have experienced extreme wildfire, flood, uh, heat and heat waves uh, and heat domes um, in, the, in the southwestern U.S. that in the western U.S. that becomes increasingly what we experience also in Europe. Um, so it's out there in the world. There are a couple of animated slides, so I'll just give um, Juliet a, a cue that um, it's going to advance now twice to provide some prompts for questions to ask ourselves. This is the way I've started to think about it. So the next prompt. What do we, emphasis on we, do now? Next prompt. What do we do now, in the immediate, in the present, today? tomorrow. I keep thinking more and more that it has to be about, um, if it's going to be incremental, it has to be about immediacy because the planet and our world um, has a trajectory of change that will be, um, is accelerating, is accelerating. And so where and how do we match that with our own work? Um, and how do we step into extraordinary change? Um, more and more, that's what keeps showing up for me is um, the asks may of, of some in our world may be incremental change and, and maybe it needs to be extraordinary change, extraordinary in any way you want to interpret that word. But that's the word that, that comes to my mind. Next slide. So a couple more things to consider. The U.S. National Climate Assessment releases next week. Climate science will be in the news a lot next week. Each time one of these national, global, regional reports comes out is another opportunity. 
each time that there's a climate change related disaster, there's another opportunity for conversation. I, I'm trying to figure out when and how do we navigate this space when we have these opportunities for conversation to share what might be on the minds of many of us might be lived experiences of many of us might feel and resonate with us in our soul but we don't often talk about we don't often talk about because there's risk involved and i'm going to take more risks today with the questions for the conversation with you all that follows the presentation is what resonates with you and what shows up in you so that that can provide some guidance to me towards um, the next prompt, please. What what do we share now? What do I share next week if I'm interviewed with a journal by a journalist? And next prompt, what's for later? Um, I've learned that I can't always assess well what's for later, and I need other people to help me with that. Um, lots of reasons for that, um, for where and how I work, but. Um, sometimes I put forward too much to the world at once <laughs> and it comes back and is met with resistance and uh, and I'm trying to do better at um, more grace, um, less resistance um, in these faces. Next slide. So in 2016, I journeyed to Antarctica for the first time with 76 women in science amazing women from around the world. The program is called Homeward Bound. They are now bringing their fifth, sixth, and some of their seventh groups to Antarctica. Literally right now, those ships are sailing. Um, we were the first group. And our hope was to learn how to change the world. We talked about it as that. How do we change the world? We were women in science, um, wondering if we were the missing ingredient, should there be more women in science and should there be more women in science in leadership positions was a big focus of this journey. Next slide. And so what follows from this is some of my experiences since that time. Um, one of the things that I've come to realize is that the earth changes us. We hear so much about how we as humans have changed the earth, but it's a reciprocal relationship. And it's one in which I, I, I stepped into this journey um, in undergrad. Um, as a freshman, I decided that to be a scientist, I needed to learn how to camp. My family um, was not one that went camping. Uh, so I had to be taught this. And I did programs like Outward Bound, uh, I started um, backpacking, camping, um, doing solo time in uh, the mountains of North Carolina. I was at school in North Carolina. And um, most scientists don't camp. Many don't um, for their work. It, it was what I thought I needed to do. And it brought me into a world of science that is so different than if I wasn't someone who could spend um, days, weeks, and even at times months in really remote parts of the earth, living in more simplistic ways and living in communion with the earth. And that's where and how the earth um, brings about change in us, though it can be from simple actions, stepping into our own backyards, stepping into the parks in our communities, um, wading into rivers and creeks, um, and, and seeing what arises in us as we experience the, the earth in new ways. It was also as a sophomore that I decided uh, in undergrad. So freshman year, I started camping. Sophomore year, I decided I wanted to take this course, Biogeochemistry, an Analysis of Global Change. Um, you can thrift um, this book now online for about $5. Um, back then, it was a $100 textbook. Um, for the class. This was the first edition. Um, it had just come out. And what caught my attention was this idea of an analysis of the global change. And I think that's where we've sat in the Western science space for some time, is that if we do enough research, and if we can tell from a empirical, logical, reasoning side, 
of understanding our planet, how our planet works to leaders of the world, to governments, to the public will be able to make the reasonable choices for where and what will reduce risk and bring about greater um, safety. I'm not so sure that's the way it works anymore. And so that's a bit of the story too. Next slide. So biogeochemistry, I put a big word out there just in case folks don't know what that is. It is literally what it sounds like. It's a little bit of all your flavors of science. It might as well be biogeo, chemical physics is involved in all of this. It's where and how we understand um, element, uh, element cycles and energy balance on our planet. This is not what most sophomores sign up to take as undergrads. It tends to be and was actually a graduate class when I took it. Um, but increasingly, we do teach this in undergraduate courses. We teach the carbon cycle, um, the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, um, and 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 where and how energy systems um, move on our planet. What I've started to think about as I've started theology school is um, next prompt. How much this might be modern alchemy, um, and I'm using that intentionally. That word alchemy. Um, I've put the definition up there because um, there are traditions from centuries past that may be important ways to think, know, and be in the world that will help guide uh, us towards where we want to head, um, towards the future we want. And as I've been giving talks the past couple of years, I increasingly use the word magic and magic of our planet and that alchemy brings that in, I think is beautiful. What will we never know? What will always, no matter who and how many different approaches we take to knowing our world, will there always be some elements that, that we don't know? And where and how do we want to show up knowing we'll never know it all. Um, and that's part of where um, my my journey has, has led me. Next slide. An example of that is tipping points. The slide has a lot on it. The main point being that in climate science, in planetary science, we talk about this idea of that there are critical thresholds that when crossed lead to um, massive planetary irreversible change in the climate system. It could be in chemical systems of the planet. It could be in um, in other ways. What may we never be able to know in this space? Uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be taking the approaches we are to understand tipping points from a Western science standpoint. But where and how can we begin to acknowledge that some of this we we, we may never know? What I've often said when I um, teach about this in my classes is we'll know what the tipping point is after we've crossed it, not before, because the Earth system is so complex. Um, so we can expect some of these, but we may not know when. And so we hear from uh, where and how government science reports, international science reports, are that we want to shoot for 1.5 C. We want to stay under 2 C. This is what 3 C, three degrees Celsius warming will look like. And where and how can we take that all in and recognize it's imperfect. Um, it won't give us a definitive certain answer about what we should be doing today. Next slide. So some storytelling. How does the earth change us? I finished my PhD and had been studying the high mountains of Colorado for five years and chose to study the Arctic tundra. I was offered two opportunities as a postdoc, one to work at a field station that is one of the most well-known, well-established field stations in the Arctic in the world. It's in Northern Alaska on the North Slope of the Brooks Range 
Roughly 200 scientists go there each summer. Many are from the U.S., but um, folks can be from around the world. And I had visited that site and was considering it. And then I got an offer to go to Kotzebue, Alaska, a population of 3,000 uh, on the edge of the Chukchi Sea, north of the Arctic Circle, in the very western part of the Brooks Range in northern Alaska. And this one had so much more adventure to it. There have been times I regretted this choice, but at this point in my life, this was what catapulted me out of seeing science in a traditional way. This town, um, next slide, in community, um, is where you see the lower star. It's on the Baldwin Peninsula, and it is in the homeland of the, the uh, Inuit people. And it is uh, a community uh, that's roughly three quarters Native Alaskan. Um, so uh, folks that come into the town um, might be there to teach, to work at the hospital who are white, um, or um, be involved with work in the park service. There are a lot of national parks up there. And the slide, and the star that you see in the middle of Noah to, or North and slightly east, that's where we were landing um, and where I lived for several summers. Next slide. This is how we got to the site. I had never flown in a bush plane before, never landed on a gravel bar in a braided river channel uh, in the tundra. Um, and I should say that as the postdoc, I was in charge. Um, it's pretty wild to have the opportunity to be in charge of something you've never done before. Um, and, and in charge just means I did a lot of the logistics planning, um, but I was working with folks from the USGS. So the plane lands, you unload belongings. Next slide. And then the plane leaves. And my crew came in on later flights. So I had three or four hours to just be there by myself in a national, in a wilderness area, more wild than I'd ever, any place I'd ever been, thinking, what did I do? <laughs> I, um, I'm a leaper. I say yes to things and I don't really think it all through. The trip to Antarctica with Homeward Bound was another example of this. And I, I don't know that I'd really prepared for this, what all um, this journey would be like. Um, so was there fear? Absolutely. Um, I didn't know when the bears would come. I just knew they were around. I knew wolves could come. I knew the creeks could get high. Um, I'd never seen the kind of ice in and on rivers that I got to see in this region. Um, thick ice where the river freezes and the ice stays well into the, the growing season. Um, so you can, you can walk across some of the rivers um, into the growing season um, in this place. So it was extraordinary. It changed my world to live here. Next slide. I hadn't read the book. That was probably a good thing um, into the wild. Uh, there's some parts of my experience are are similar to what um, the the lead in that book um, speaks of. This is the braided river channel uh, that I was camped on living on with two staff. What you'll see is there are places in this landscape with trees and without trees. And one of the questions, is how fast can tree line move? And what will happen as trees move into tundra? Next slide. The picture on the left is from that landscape and that's a small white spruce, small, it's old. That tree is probably seedling, seedling because it's still so small. Um, tree, because it's old, is probably 30 or 40 years old and wouldn't um, reach mid-calf. Um, so really, really slow growth of these plants. But what I knew I wanted to know about the landscape and what I knew without even starting to study it, this is what I want to speak into, is how much intuition is part of being a scientist. And we don't often get to speak of it 
if I wrote this into a scientific paper, every reviewer would criticize it and tell me I needed to take it out of the paper. And I'm still trying to figure out where and what are the spaces that we can talk about intuition. The intuition that I had in this landscape is when those seeds land from the white spruce, does it matter? Does it matter where they grow? And what I learned through, I expected it did. I expected it mattered a lot. And that the tundra, the vitality of the tundra, healthy tundra would slow the rate of a, for, a forest moving into tundra. And the data I collected supports that, that it is not that common for a white spruce to grow pictured like you're seeing in the middle of a healthy uh, tussock. They grow on dead tussocks more than you would expect them to by chance alone. And they grow in the bare soil. So big disturbances to the North Slope of Alaska will have a much greater impact on moving a forest north and up in elevation. Whereas if the tundra vegetation itself stays healthy, it's going to take longer because the trees don't tend to be able to compete with a healthy plant. That intuition is part of, uh, once I started realizing how intuition worked for me in science, is where and how I did my PhD research. So my PhD research uh, is on the plant with the yellow flower that you see in this picture. It's called alpine rose. Alpine avens is another name for it, but it's not even in the rose family. And this plant, it's so cool what it does. 20% of its carbon, of what it accumulates in um, mass within the plant, it puts into a secondary chemical that changes and improves soil health for itself, but for any species that happens to grow in its vicinity. Where and how there can be a plant that um, now what I would speak about it as is altruistic. It's an example of an altruistic plant. Um, and I, I can't even tell you how I chose this plant to study. Like that's long enough ago. And, and, it, and it was when I was thinking about science in such a different space that I just remember feeling like, I don't know what I'm going to do for my PhD, but whatever it's going to be, this plant is going to be part of the story. And then it ended up being the central um, species. And, and there's still more to study and understand about what this plant does um, and how it changes the ecosystem for the benefit of other species. Next slide. See, so then my journey took me to Northern Greenland. This is Ingefeld land. Um, I was there in the early 2000s. Next prompt will show you a map of how far north I was. Uh, people have joked about how does a plant biologist end up deciding to go here? Because the landscape is mostly rocks. And this day in Ingefeld land, um, the helicopter um, that was funded for research flew from where we were staying on a U.S. Air Force base to this region so we could walk across a landscape that was more remote and other than big changes, um, big changes from the atmosphere, big changes from climate, um, we could consider fairly pristine, that there had been very little disturbance, human disturbance across this landscape. But that doesn't mean that there wasn't human presence um, because the Inupak people, um, this would be a region where they would be present um, and had long been present as well. This is an area that stayed more or less ice-free ice, ice free, um, of the Greenland ice sheet. Um, for a longer period of time. I got dropped off by the helicopter. Everyone else stayed on the helicopter and went somewhere else. So this is another chance where I had a time to just walk and be present for the earth, be present with the earth um, in a way that I'd come to um, really appreciate. The plant that you're seeing in the foreground is probably a thousand year old, old plant, possibly older, it's Arctic willow, and that's what it grows like. It doesn't grow up. 
this is too windy and too extreme a climate for uh, a plant to to grow up from the ground. Uh, next prompt. I walked the landscape. Oop, sorry. Thanks. Um, I walked the landscape looking for signs, signs of what, what was there to learn from the earth in this place? The dogma in Arctic and Alpine plant science is that these plants live in such an extreme environment, they can't reproduce sexually by seed. That each plant that you're looking at, if you can get some sense from this photo of there being plants for which we can't see a above ground connection, that there is some stem below ground connecting one plant to the other plant to the other plant. So big below ground stems um, uh, because uh, seeds would establish so rarely. As I walked the landscape, I could see that these were plants were genetically different. I knew that it had been sexual reproduction because the leaves had just enough variety of difference in their shapes. Color, shape of leaves, branching architecture, flowering differences, really subtle signs in the morphology, the shape of things that indicated it couldn't be all the same plant. So I wrote a proposal to the National Science Foundation asking to do research so that I could understand the sexual variation in these plants. And the motivation for that was that this plant, Arctic willow, is the only plant that's got any capacity to store carbon in this landscape. And if there's only one species um, that has the capacity to store carbon in a the landscape, then the genetic variation is what will um, drive carbon storage in the landscape. Um, uh, the the potential that different clones, uh, different individuals of the species um, might be more productive than others. Um, so that's what I put in for a proposal. The reviewers came back and they said, um, we're not going to fund this project because it's all one big clone. <laughs> and um, where and when we see ideas in our world, and this is just in the science world, we can picture in our, our bigger, like, all the sciences and all the um, cultural spaces and religious spaces, how hold we hold on, how long we hold on to ideas for, and don't provide the support needed to do a study. So I used my network. The, the research happened. It happened through my network. I wrote to friends and people I knew who um, were going to be in the Arctic. And I asked them to send me back leaves of the plant collected in a certain way that I could do genetic analyses. And then a friend of mine who was a geneticist did the analyses um, and had graduate students running the, uh, the samples so that we could do it with no money. And so we did the study with no money and we demonstrated that there was a lot of sexual reproduction in these plants, um, which is wonderful to have done. Um, but maybe we should find other ways for science to happen. Um, when we really want to say, how does this work? And maybe it works in a way that's totally different than the way we've long thought of it. And long thought of it, the dogma came out of studies from the 30s and 40s when um, white Western scientists went north um, or up in elevation and did studies for two or three years. And I would argue that um, we don't learn about the biology of 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 year old plants by studying them for a couple of years. Uh, we got to think of some, some other ways to learn um, when plants are this old. Next slide. So that the, though the earth changes us and it can change us in extraordinary ways. And I believe that we can rapidly be, step into spaces of personal, and societal transformation through relationship with the earth. The systems often remain the same. And this is a recent study. It was the re research from social science that just came out this fall, um, October um, of 2023. Um, and it just helps us see that systems have really long residence times. A long residence time in biogeochemistry is um, something like when carbon gets stored in um, fossil fuels. 
fossil fuels, if we don't dig them up, have a really long residence time. The carbon's there over geologic time. Um, and so if we are changing our planet in ways that we're moving elements around that had long residence times and we're moving them and accelerating so that there are short residence times, we have to think about where and how our systems start to transform in, um, in much faster ways than what has happened in the past. Next slide. Well, our women in science, women in science and women in leadership, um, the way forward. We have been working, we, the grand we, um, since when I started my undergraduate degree. Part of what enabled me to pursue a PhD and see that research was something I wanted to do was that in the 90s, there were more and more programs aimed at bringing and retaining women in science. So as an undergrad, that experience is that you can get funding um, for a summer to be able to work in the mountains. You can get funding for a summer to be able to go to the tropics. You can get funding for a summer um, uh, to do research on the campus. Um, that was the first experience I had was to stay and do a research experience after my freshman year um, on my campus. And it was always enough money to cover travel, to cover cost of living wherever I was and or provide um, um, places for me to stay and food. And it was also uh, the travel, sorry, I said the travel would be covered. And then there was always a stipend. And with the stipend, I would have enough money to be able to pay some of my expenses for college uh, the next year. And it was enough. We are still doing programs like that with the idea of bringing more folks who've been underrepresented in science, women and people of color um, across all genders into the sciences without seeing a change in some fields like my own um, of the proportion of women staying in science. This program, The Homeward Bound, perhaps some of you watched the film, The Leadership, that was of the first um, expedition um, for this program. It focused a lot on the change, um, changes that we could do knowing ourselves better, knowing our strengths, knowing where and how we show up in different places and being intentional in our choices. And there is an incredible amount of power in doing that. But we, in that first expedition, several, um, several of my peers in the group, kept asking that we expand our thinking to also in, in the in the practice and the in the experiences of our learning to where and how do we change systems do we see that when we have changed and we step back into a system that hasn't changed it may be really hard so we spent a lot of time on the journey in this room we also spent time out in the wild. So a couple slides to show you. Next prompt, next slide. That we were on a ship in Antarctica. There were opportunities to see and experience whales, um, penguins, um, species I'd never seen, and were surreal. Sometimes when you see a new, a new environment and the animals and how they live in that environment, I just kept thinking, that's what penguins do? Oh my God, I had no idea. The first, first sight, sighting of penguins as they were swimming in the water, they look like mini dolphins jumping in the sea, um, but in big pods. Um, and that's not at all the language a wildlife biologist would use to talk about penguins, but that's the one that a plant biologist would use because I just, I had no idea what to expect of them. Next slide. We spent time on land, on ice. Uh, Greg Mortimer was uh, the naturalist. He's a, a Australian mountaineer. Uh, so some pretty extraordinary stories from his experiences in Antarctica we had a chance to hear about. Um, but ultimately, the next slide. Applying what we learned worked for some and not others. 
they do, applying what I learned did not work for me in the first year, the second year, the third year, the fourth year after I was back. I kept trying to navigate into spaces, trying to figure out maybe if I try these ideas out here, they'll work. And some of it was the the lean in ideas of Cheryl Sandberg and in spaces with a lot of resistance that aren't ready. The community readiness article is one that I learned about. Um, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for us to change and show up to a space that's not ready to change. Um, and this isn't just one space that I stepped into um, when I came back. It's three, it's four spaces that I stepped into. And the best summary I can provide of a different way of thinking about it. So sometimes the way to um, tell a story is to talk about what didn't go well. For this particular story, it's a really hard story to tell what didn't go well. So instead of telling that story, I wrote this article with Deb Morrison. It published in 2021 as part of a, a series of articles on what could be different in this space of science. And that's what we highlight. And part of what we highlighted is that um, diverse ideas, it's not just what, what we can see on the outside of us. If people are being brought into spaces because they've been underrepresented in the sciences before, we have to create space for differences in ideas, differences in philosophies, whole differences in the way of being in a space. And we haven't changed the culture of science in a way that, that that's possible. And as somebody who works at a Native American serving institution, this is something that I I feel obligated to champion is creating that difference in space because it's now 15 years of teaching indigenous students um, science, environmental science, and not just teaching them, learning with them in ways that I am more the learner than they are in these spaces. And with my learning, I can see where and how the spaces that I navigated into um, starting back in the 90s um, aren't ones that are as open to them even if they know all the science um, in the Western science tradition, where and how can we change these systems? That's what that article is about. So we can keep doing the work for systems change is, is what this gets at. A few more slides um, I think we have to go. Let's see what's next. All right, so radical transformation. Are you ready? <laughs> what does that look like? Um, that's where we need to head. And I'm using the word radical. Um, intentionally. This summer, I had the opportunity to be part of this transformations conference. There's me in the center. It was a Zoom conference. It was organized um, by one of my peers from the first Homeward Bound expedition uh, um, and a woman who was on a later a Homeward Bound expedition, um, Juliana. And it was a chance to do some storytelling about transformation. Uh, if we can go away from the slides for a minute, um, this is going to be a reading, and I think I want to um, be large for this. So the reason this is a reading is because I don't know how to tell this story any other way. So we'll exit the screen share for a moment. And I, I hope that this prompts some conversation for us all. This is the riskiest thing I'm going to do right now is to read this to you all. So here goes. Stories of transformation challenge us to let go, to believe. For folks who are living in the liminal space, from who you were to who you are, who you have always been, I hope this story supports those folks on their journey. My journey from a childhood that was tough, achievement to cope, putting the lessons of Homeward Bound to practice and experiencing reactive behaviors in academia when I did, led me to hours of counseling with a, with a psychologist named Doug to make sense of what was happening. Beginning in 2017, the year after the Homeward Bound expedition, 
I was falling fast and hard. There seemed to be no end. Yet falling opens us up. And openness is essential for transformation of processes, of people, and societies. In October of 2021, Doug dropped a bomb on me, or at least that's how it felt. He said, our ideas are not our own. A tear fell. I gasped for air. My body began to shake. And I sobbed. I felt a wave of grief and then of anguish. In that moment, I, the person I knew myself to be, was dying. My mind questioned, if my ideas are not me, then who am I? Since childhood, I had built an identity around my ideas as my own. I was my ideas. This is central to life in Western-influenced cultures. It was also my portal to safety as a child. In the instant when Doug said, our ideas are not our own, I was no one. Though terrifying, I absorbed the idea. It permeated me. This was possible because I had been living in the liminal for five years. I was no longer the me I knew, and not yet truly me. The fall is necessary and vital. It often lasts a while, not one week or three, not 40 days and 40 nights, not one year or two, Many years, possibly a lifetime, maybe more than one lifetime. So when we offer programs, initiatives, when we speak of personal and societal transformation, and we all must, it's clear we need to head somewhere different than where we are. There should be transparency. The best thing that may happen to you will first feel like the worst thing that has happened to you. Allow for the fall. We can let folks know there's no certainty how long they will fall. We can create space and folks with whom to talk about falling, people who can guide us as we fall and as we rise. These are spiritual directors, psychologists, pastors, yogis. I've started to talk about it as uh, doulas of the liminal um, because it's a rebirthing um, that happens. And I actually met someone this summer um, here in my region. I, she, she made these earrings, um, actually. And, uh, and she um, introduced herself once we started to get to know each other um, as a doula of the liminal. And I was like, no way, I just used that phrase. So that one's not just me. There's other folks seeing that, that um, rebirthing is hard if we try to do it all on our own. For the folks whose behaviors lead others to fall, join us. See the fall that you are in and the rise that is possible. Societal transformation depends on all of us. As we fall, we can open to faith, to believe that we can heal, that we can rise, and that there is a higher power who is loving with us and for us. After five years of falling, clinging, and ultimately the death of who I was, there was a moment when I thought I wouldn't change a thing. My childhood, my profession, homeward bound, staying true to myself and my values in the face of adversity, or the fall. If not for these, I would not know myself. I would not be more me. And what the world needs now has always needed is us, our true and holy selves. Can you feel it? The divine in you in the universe 
pulling us closer together. I see evidence for this in our world all the time. If we can embrace that ideas are an offering to us through a collective subconscious from a benevolent universe, the creator, God, what might change for you, in you, and for our world? May you receive ideas, love, and grace to arrive into yourself and be in relationship with all. That's only the second time I've read that. And thank you for the love, the hearts, the emotions that I can see in the videos you all have. Um, it's a space, it's a new space for me. It's a space to gravitate, gravitate into, um, that brought me into the space of exploring, um, the nature of God. Um, where does one do that? Certainly by connecting more to the earth, but it has to be with one another and it has to be for the conversation in a way that new conversations take place. Um, that are outside of what I'm comfortable with and maybe outside what some of you all are comfortable with. For me, that meant um, starting theology school uh, this fall um, at the Isla School of Theology uh, with what's been arriving. Um, the way I was teach talking about it is to teach and preach, but I know I don't want to preach in a church. And as I've um, talked to more people, um, I've learned that there's a vocation that is called public theology and public theology is this space where we bring in um, understanding of the divine to the conversations um, that are in my mind that each of us and, and many of us need to have. And for me, it's an interfaith space. It's a without thinking or um seeing one faith tradition as having all of the answers. Um, so much beauty is in the mix across faith traditions in our world. Um, and that's what's been showing up for me. Um, I'm also working on a certification to be a yoga teacher. And that's with um, understanding that these practices from um, Asia um, in the tradition of yoga, the eight limbs of yoga have um, guided many um, through the same experiences that are so human and are so present for many of us in the world. So I keep seeing what I'm learning in yoga pop up in Christian spaces, pop up in Jewish spaces, pop up in um, spaces of psychology, pop up in the spaces of science um, that I'm part of. Uh, um, and it's beautiful when we start to see um, the threads that interconnect one place to another. I want to look at time. Um, we've been here for about an hour and I want to leave a little more space. So I just want to do one more thing with the slides. So can we go back to the slides? I want to do an example of what can take place, of what can happen. So we're going to go forward to a slide that shows um, the earth. Uh, okay, so this is perfect. I did it right. So what's modern alchemy? Um, magic, um, where and how? Um, can we see what emerges in community? So the next prompt is going to show you something I put on Facebook. Oh, let's go. Sorry, let's go back to this one. So this is what I put on Facebook. The earth and us, healing going in each direction. And I asked folks to say what and how could this look different than the way that I'm putting it forward? An earth box and an us box and healing. And so here's the first idea that came forward. People said, no, we have to be part of the earth. Us has to be within the earth box. It can't be separate box. And we can do that. This is a way that biogeochemists tend to conceptualize things. And then I asked people to um, add other words. What else are the processes by which we relate to the earth? And this is a mix of some of the words that came up. Next slide. Then people said we have to not have 
this has to, we have to be fully in, in the earth space. And um, so that means dissolving the boundary um, of that box um, that separates us from the earth. Next slide. Oh, here we go. So um, some folks said that they like the word humans better than us. Um, I love the idea of playing around with that some because I saw us as a way to speak of us in community with other species, that us is all of us, the living world, um, not humans alone. Um, but I think that this also has some value to it. And then let's see if there's one more. Oh, some, this one I loved. Somebody said it can't be lines, that any which way we connect um, ourselves with the earth has to be um, in awareness that there's flow and it's fluid and um, um, yeah, lines, we've seen too many lines in our world. We should get rid of the lines um, and stop seeing things as linear because um, so much is nonlinear. Um, so now we'll come back forward to the whole group, remove the slides and uh, um, stop sharing screen and see what conversation emerges. But that's an example. That's an example of um, what we can pull out of one another. Whatever comes, whatever I put on paper into a talk if it's just me, is never as beautiful as if it's in community. And that's what I see you all doing in pro-social world, building that space for this to be community. So with that, I'll turn it over back to Donia for where and how to facilitate discussion. Thank you, Heidi. Mm. My, I'm, I feel my body is shaking. That's how much this, and I know I'm not the only one I saw in the chat that uh, I think it's pronounced Yan, the Napoli, was weeping. So know that our bodies are, have heard you. And um, you spoke of uh, teach and, and preach once, you know, you, the fall, uh, you, you embraced being on the ground and, uh, and, and, uh, and, I've, I've, I've been playing with this phrase of uh, behaviors that are caught, not taught. And, I, and, and you telling your story enables me to, like you're, you're allowing for us to catch uh, this, uh, this wisdom. Uh, and, and I feel immensely grateful as someone who uh, identifies as a renegade economist. <laughs> <laughs> For 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 the opportunity for us to because with your courage of bringing this here, I feel like all of us are empowered to to um, to soften into into the fall and what that has meant to us and and I've really felt the invitation to um, to um, lean into that storytelling uh, in a very um, profound way. And uh, and I thought it was also nice for those who arrived later. I, I lit a candle to honor the to to invite the sacred space, and the the candle is basically has completely melted. So you have uh, <laughs> really, I think there is something here that I will want to watch and rewatch, and I'm so grateful that others will get to to watch this. And we have about half an hour on the clock, usually about 28 minutes, how we do it. So we probably have about 20 minutes of conversation and the invitation that this is the one, the first of, of many conversations. And um, so, and, and when I called in the ancestors, it's interesting listening to you, there was a sense in which, oh, I want to acknowledge the land, the unceded Mi'kmaq territory that uh, that make it so that I can be here present with you, that nourishes me, that that uh, that has all these words that you listed. And so, uh, when 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 we share, when I'm I'm inviting each one of us when when we share to um, to share where our feet touch the ground, and uh, which land we're in relationship with, in addition to to speaking our name. Um, so I am Dunya, and I um, my feet touch the ground on unceded Mi'kmaq territory here in southwest Nova Scotia. The other thing that I didn't mention is that the flowers looked so much like those Alpen rose, and so this 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 uh, you inviting oh there there's been so much beauty in what you've shared, and 
now I understand what David Sloan Wilson speaks about. He's always the fourth one talking because I, I can see how I, I would want to take up all the space <laughs> and I want to honor everyone else who has, who has things to, to uh, you invited us, you had two questions. Um, that was what resonates? So mm -hmm. inviting us to really lean into that body, into the, the, the body of uh, what resonates, what, how did it, and then to ask ourselves, how it show, how is it showing up? So how it resonates, but also what's the quality of that resonance mm -hmm. and uh, inviting stories. Um, and, and, uh, and the idea also, the precious gift of uh, ideas are gift to us. And how, what, what, if to allow that to start to, to, to land and what that can mean. So, mm -hmm. so that you can um, allow for what is in you, what is alive in you to be a gift to us. Um, so please, uh, for those who are, I know that some are catching this in transit and I see not everyone has their camera on. If you're able to have your camera on, please turn it on because it really does create a different space uh, for us. And, and if it's only us four that can be on camera, that's, that's also, um, that's okay. Um, thank you. Oh. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And with that, um, I want to have faith uh, that uh, you will have the courage to speak up when you feel called to do so. And the floor is open. Uh huh. Oh, it's dinner in Sweden. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, an intergenerational. Thank you for that. And food. <laughs> the we get to share. Um, I would love to say something. Hi, Heidi. Hey, hey. I'm literally still weeping. I I know Heidi from Homeward Bound. We were on the first voyage together and we connected and have stayed connected. And I saw her mom was here. Hi, Nancy. Um, you raised a beautiful, beautiful daughter. Um, <laughs> I am just, I've always been so moved by the way you, you are the most heart-centered scientist I, I know. And I know a lot of scientists. And that's always been something that has impressed me so much about you and moved me. And what you shared in that reading and that writing was so deep and beautiful and powerful and resonated as you can see so strongly because I have been in that falling space as well. Mm -hmm. And, and I will tell you it, it's, I'm just, I feel like I am just now coming out on the other side of it and what, what it was for me. And I know you will get this was about a month ago. I saw Jane Goodall speak in person for the second time. The first time was about 15 years ago. And I actually saw her twice in one day. <laughs> I bought tickets for the night. And then I saw she was going to be at the Museum of Science in Boston in the afternoon. I'm like, I'm going to both. And, and she has been my lifelong shero since I was four years old. I wanted to grow up and be her. And she has been sort of my guiding light through. And she still is. She's still my, my role model. Um, and she comes from such a heart-centered place. And in at the museum in the afternoon, I was literally seated directly in front of her about five feet away. And there was a point near the beginning of her talk where she looked up and she literally was staring right into my eyes when she said the importance of doing what you your heart tells you to do and, and what you're passionate about. And that's your gift to share with the world. And I went, oh, and it was like this switch, something unlocked inside of me. And, and from that moment forward, the universe has just been going, here you go. This is what you're meant to do. Like, remember who you are and why you're here and what you're meant to do. And you, what you just shared resonated. It felt like that. And I appreciate your vulnerability. I mean, that was a very vulnerable sharing and it was profoundly beautiful. And I appreciate who you are so much. I'm so grateful that you are my friend. Thank you. Diane taught me about penguins, yeah. just in case. We connected in many ways, many spiritual ways, but the penguins um, were one of the ways we connected while we were on the ship. She's an yeah. expert in penguin biology. <laughs> and then where the, do your feet touch the ground? 
Oh, sorry. My feet touched the ground in Massachusetts. So the Massachusetts tribe originally was here where my feet touched the ground. Thank you for reminding me. Yep. And Kathleen, okay. I see your, your hand is up. Um, I also uh, want to thank you for this a very heartfelt um, and compelling presentation, Heidi. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed your combining of the um, the science field of biogeochemistry and the word alchemy. And when you said that, I was reminded, you probably know this, but you didn't mention it specifically that in, in metaphorical or like Jungian psychology, alchemy represents the spiritual uh, transformation, you know, represented by turning lead into gold. Mm -hmm. And there is a way that you're um, modeling what it means to trust in your, um, uh, that your ideas are your own, and yet they're not your own, and they're worth mm -hmm. sharing, because they're reflecting, you know, your journey as a human spirit. Um, that that's part of it, that you can both have that fall, have that kind of stepping out of ego and self and, and yet returning to it because that's what we all need because we we do have a finite life <laughs> and you know I might believe in life after death or, or not but um, I know that it's in this life that we can in, in, impact one another. And I also just was wondering out of curiosity, so that's what resonated for me that this was a, a wonderful gift in terms of helping us trust ourselves. Um, especially as women, because I've had many experiences similar to yours on a small level of being dismissed in mm -hmm. uh, in academic and other uh, settings where the instructors don't see my perspective or don't, are not willing to uh, even respect or give me credence. So um, th that's that's also I, I I love the story of the uh, of how you saw that those Arctic willows you know, were, were variegated. There was variation, you know, uh, uh, selection and replication there. And yet what was held to was just old theory mm -hmm. conducted in a limited amount of time a long time ago. So, and have you, are you familiar with Rupert Sheldrake's work, Morphic Resonance? I'll put it in the chat and Is I said, yeah that you follow up on his work. He's a, started out with a PhD in plant cell biology and, and has created some wonderful theories that have the kind of spiritual connection that you're pursuing. Thank, and, you. And thank you. And I'm done. <laughs> Where are your feet, Kathleen? I'm on my phone, so I was turning off my phone so I could write in the chat, because um, uh, I have to hold my hand, my, the phone in my hand and move it around. I'm in Portland. Uh, I'm in the place that is known as Portland, Oregon, which is the, the land of the Kethlamet um, and uh, uh, the uh, peoples. On the in the Columbia River Gorge. Thank you, Kathleen. Yay. I see you, Viveka. Hi. <laughs> um, Heidi, just uh, amazing to listen to you and to your story. Uh, you just have such a, I don't know, wildness and courage and brilliance to you. Uh, I uh, I so uh, I'm so inspired by it and and your journey and what you shared. So so just deep deep thanks. Um, 
And it's amazing that sitting here with my daughter, one of my daughters, and then my husband and, and our cat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you've entertained us, you know, and like inspired us as we are. Uh, Eating broccoli. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as we cooked our meal and, and shared that together. Um, yeah, one of our daughters isn't here, but. But also my youngest daughter that Maya was curious about you, uh, listening to your story, Heidi. So uh, the last part of it. So also just your your storytelling ability, I think it's is really captivating. And um, you know, it's almost like I I thought, oh, I haven't I'm not falling enough, you know, I need to fall more. Um, that's sort of one thing that came to me as I listened to you. Um, I think it's that courage that's that's really that strikes me in you. So, thank you, Rika. Thank you. It's fun to see your family dinner and to feel a part of it, even though of course it's um not quite lunch here <laughs> where I am. Um the the beauty of how we can be connected um across this planet, right? And yes. there's wonderful parts of technology because we are connected the earth water air connect us all and we need to be able to have these kind of connections yeah. of humans too indeed so i think you know we're creating some sort of mycelium here um yeah. and um we are i my feet are in in lund sweden and i was thinking what who is sort of Vikings. Yeah, mm -hmm. those are our ancestors, and but, but Vikings is so general. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a it's a beautiful practice of uh, of the United States and Canada, I think, to these days when you honor kind of heritage of uh, the people in the land. Uh, and I feel kind of I feel ignorant. I, I mean, I am ignorant uh, when it comes to other than just you know lot of Scandinavians here I suppose uh, the good thing is that the land is really mixing up today uh, so lots of people from different parts of the world here today so that makes it more diverse and interesting but I think the roots are fairly homogeneous uh, mm. I'm guessing thank you Rebecca. thank you for inviting the curiosity I think that for a lot of us the first thing is, is to feel it's interesting to notice the fact that you don't know the name of the ancestral roots and what they, and then to just allow for curiosity. I find that there's so much unlearning, but there's also so much learning and to just be okay with not knowing and the fact that we don't know. And so like, how are we shifting and how are we changing right now? I love that question, Heidi, thank you so much. And and in the spirit of, of education, um, when listening to you, what uh, I was reminded of and, and so, it is not mine. It is just a gift for me to share. is uh, is the work of um, um, uh, the, the book Braiding Sweet Grass, and I'll put mm -hmm. the link in the in the chat because that is to me a poem, and I listen to it over and over again. It's read by the author. Author, if you uh, get it on on uh, audiobook, and it's um, it really is a, a treat on on so many levels. So I'll put the link for that. And I really want to invite Hi. you to. Um, Heidi, um, uh, I don't know if I can fully say this, but um, yeah, your, your talk had a, a really magical effect on me. And, uh, I just thank you for all that. And, uh, yeah, I live on the, uh, the River Thames um, water catchment and um, with my drinking water and it's it's flowing out of my eyes at the moment and uh, um yeah it's still very grateful to have, have met you um when you appeared into our psychology world as a as a leaper as a mountain scientist uh, having read steve hayes's a liberated mind book <laughs> and just knowing that that was something that was missing for you then values and uh and through that and all the connections that came out of that, of, you know, meeting Vivica, who's here, and uh, Anna, who was here mm -hmm. earlier, 
she's here in um, spirit Anna is. <laughs> yeah she's here in spirit and then everyone else is connected and through pro-social and yeah Michael and um, yeah and design school everyone who's here so um yeah just thank you for um yeah thank you for being a beautiful leader and um yeah you've really um, yeah you're a yeah you're a piece of my heart now and uh, and uh, my work and uh, yeah and everyone else who's now come into contact so thank you thank you richard I'll jump on in. Hi, Heidi. Um, beautiful, beautiful message. And what really resonated with me is how you can try to bring change into a space like in science, but that space might not be accepting or ready for that change. And this is where you come into play because you're really bridging the gaps between spirituality and scientific knowledge and I wish you tons of success in continuing to promote this message because there's basically nobody else out there doing it. And it's so important um, for, for science and for the planet. Um, so I'm Andrew Warren. I, I actually went down and saw Heidi at the Haven this spring. And uh, now I'm on the Colorado Front Range. Thanks, Heidi. Thank you, Andrew. I found that there are other people um, stepping into this space and that it's resonating um and it's resonating in so many um communities of practice spaces i step into except for the western trained scientists mm -hmm. <laughs> which is why i hang out with a lot of psychologists these days <laughs> is um the resistance, um, the, so, so one of the beautiful things that showed up in stepping into theology school is that of all the professors at ILIF, there's only one who I felt like I really needed to have a meeting with for in person in the first time that we were doing some in-person learning in Denver. And, um, and I didn't know that much about him, but I, I very much felt I, I needed to talk to Professor Hernandez and Professor Hernandez is um, an expert in mysticism. He's an expert in um, where and how religion was part of the founding um, value system for Western science pre-enlightenment, and then where and how we've evolved Western science in a way that divorced it from the the sort of founding that he spoke of um and this is from um books that he's now guided me towards reading um and i could make a list and give that as a resource for dunya to go with the presentation um but uh but i can't recall them all um in an instant um how scientists pre-enlightenment wanted there to be less suffering in the world and that came from a religious tradition in their thinking and their feeling of um, where and how do we care for more people and reduce suffering in the world. And then now we th we think about, I, I think it's still there in what so many scientists want. And we've just stepped into this space where we say, we can't talk about that. And, and why? Like, right? That's the, like curiosity I have. It's like, why can't we talk about that? Because when we engage with the media as scientists, if we only bring the facts, we are not showing up as our full selves and we are not um, human enough to be connected with and we seem removed. And so, so, so some journalists let us as scientists speak to more spaces. Um, I have some favorite ones and then others, um, they're wonderful humans, I'm sure but they feel tied to the traditions of what news reporting is. And they're like, no, 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 no. If you say all that, we can't put that in because we just need you to tell us um, some version of, um, often I am going to say this. I feel like a lot of times the what they're looking for is it's bad and it's going to get worse. 
And what I've had a lot of conversations with Vivica and Richard in, in our, our, our psychology climate justice group is that that may be true, but we have to create spaces for love and community um, at the same time, um, because fear alone and hearing of what we don't want being a bigger part of the world doesn't bring people together. And so um, in the work that I've done with them, yeah, Diane, we talk about hope and we talk about what we want to move towards. So knowing what the away space is in the acceptance co commitment therapy act matrix world is important, but knowing and speaking about what we want to move towards today, right? Let's start with today, the now, um, family dinner, <laughs> um, feeling connected, um, sharing something um, about ourselves that when it comes out of our mouths, we have a sneaky moment of regret before we're like, damn it, I, I should have said that years ago instead of just now. <laughs> so um, yeah, um, I would go as far as faith um, and trust in one another. Um, and then allowing for that. Sometimes it's not the right thing to say. I've decided that I have to allow for that. Sometimes the error will be saying something and being like, Ooh. and then starting to have grace so that um, when, if, and something I say causes harm to own that, um, if it meets resistance to be curious um, and to begin to recognize. So um, I can see somebody's got their hand up, Michael. Hello, uh, thank you. Um, I, I wasn't uh, going to jump, uh, listening to your song uh, was beautiful enough and it didn't need uh, me other than to say thank you. Um, I felt a need to jump in uh, at one point because um, I wanted to clap up your courage um, in um, in coming out of a closet. That it is um, it is an act of fierceness and an example to others that then allows them us to access our own courage and realize that we're not waiting for you. That it is acting in our own lives. That uh, we're 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 it's ourselves that uh, are being called and uh, and um and that what what having others with whom to speak mm -hmm. and others others who are examples to us um both the examples inspire us and then the language of 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 prototyping new ways of understanding prototyping new new new, new words new sentences new stories um which you gave us one and it was beautiful and i really want to um thank you for that and we receive stories where get, you know it's 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 uh it's it's an interdance and um and i just it was is a beautiful thing to behold last thing i'd like to thank you on was um i was i was working this week on on a on diagramming um a process for mm -hmm. how collectives um through chaos and through breakdown, um, you could say mysticism, if you will, collective mysticism, uh, are um, <clears throat> are led to breakthroughs, how emergence arises from stepping outside of the familiar. And I was struggling with using models and mental, you know, to, to speak to what people already know mm -hmm. and how much do what I say repeats what they already know and so they think they know what I'm talking about or do I, do I go ever so liminal, as you said, marginal, off, off the edges. And just listening to you uh, encouraged me to, to, to use more colors, to, to, uh, to talk about the dissolution. I was resisting, I was resisting that yes, we, the, the self we know must, must dissolve for, for a space to arise. And I just, I just, as I say, you telling your story is rippling in, in countless ways. And I just want to really acknowledge it profoundly, completely. Friends, we are approaching the bottom of the hour. I 
I'm happy to stay on uh, a bit longer for whoever feels called. And I want to honor people's commitment and time commitment. Um, some of us have had to jump off already. Uh, Susan Graham, for example, writes, your presentation was interesting and your delightful. Uh, your personal story deserves to be shared widely. So I thought that was- Thank you, good. Dunia. I'm glad to stay on too, especially if um, there are a few people who want to ask a question or offer something in a smaller space. Um, and if we want to stop the recording maybe so that it can just be- Beautiful, um, yes, absolutely. In the moment